Good morning, traders, and welcome to the ProTrader webinar series. Uh, we do this uh, once a quarter or so. Uh, and uh, today we have Brent Kachuba. Uh, he actually presented on Tuesday, so I'll show you where the recording is for that as well. Uh, and this is part two. Okay, so part one, Brent went through uh, this uh, uh, spot gamma uh, service and the levels here, which are, um, as you guys know, uh, that are using this product. Uh, are amazing, okay? Uh, we've been uh, showing it uh, uh, quite a bit, and you can see even Scott uh, Polsini and yesterday's Pro Trader webinar was looking right at him. We tweeted it out as well afterwards, like how uh, it went right to uh, uh, the put wall uh, that was uh, down on the S&P uh, E-mini uh, uh, yesterday. So uh, anyway, uh, let me go through a little bit here about uh, uh, Brent and Spock Gamma. Brent has been in equities and derivatives for almost 20 years. Uh, he worked for both uh, BAA and uh, Credit Suisse uh, and um, uh, as an equities broker in, in algorithmic sales and trading. Uh, following that, he was an institutional sales for Wolverine, representing their electronic derivatives trading platform. Currently, Brent uh, trades some proprietary strategies and runs SpotGamma.com, which publishes uh, various metrics on uh, options data. Uh, this is Brent's and Spot Gamma's uh, information here. Uh, the website, there's the um, uh, levels of, of subscription service. I'm going to show you that here briefly and show you where you can get the recordings for these webinars as well. Uh, but uh, they're offering this service here. Uh, is $29 a month up to $99 a month for the full service. You can get it from the bookmap.com. Uh, bookmap marketplace and uh, uh, here's uh, spot gamma's email as well as info at spot gamma uh, and then their twitter feed uh, and then special offers for bookmap uh, from brent here uh, let's um, go through the uh, risk disclosure uh, and then let me show you some of those resources and then i'll give it over to brent uh, general disclosure all bookmap limited materials information and presentations are for educational purposes only and should not be considered specific investment advice nor recommendations live trading is in simulation demo paper trading mode and strictly for educational purposes live trading executed in simulation cannot accurately represent realistic trading performance risk disclosure trading futures equities and digital currencies involves substantial risk of loss and is not suitable for all investors an investor could potentially lose all or more than the initial investment. Risk capital is money that can be lost without jeopardizing one's financial security nor lifestyle. Only risk capital should be used for trading and only those with sufficient risk capital should consider trading. Past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. Good morning, David. Good morning, Doug. Um, all right, let me just show you guys a few things here uh, and then uh, we'll turn it right over to the expert. Uh, just from our marketplace here, uh, you can go to the marketplace from bookmap dot com here click on the more button and then uh, you can click on uh, one of the links here in the marketplace or I right click on the uh, marketplace and it's actually a link um, and that'll bring you to the bookmap marketplace here uh, scroll down a little bit and here is spot gamma okay so we'll click on this here uh, and uh, this is the service they're offering uh, these uh, expert uh, uh, gamma levels uh, from twenty nine dollars a month uh, you can this is the spot gamma pro Okay, you can also get the spot gamma levels here, uh, and it's, that's, I'm sorry, uh, spot gamma pro is $99, spot gamma levels is $29. Uh, and uh, you can uh, you can purchase it here, you can read a little bit about it, et cetera, and then uh, I'm sure Brent will uh, be talking about this as well. Uh, the recordings, okay, uh, for these webinars, I go to our YouTube page, scroll down a little bit here, and um, uh, ProTrader webinar series here, You'll see them all, and uh, this is the one from uh, uh, Brent on, uh, on on Tuesday here, okay? All right, so other than that, uh, let me turn it over to Brent, and uh, looking forward to this. Cool, thanks, Bruce. Um, I'll just mention quick the, the difference between those two levels are um, that the $29 gives you just the levels, and, and hopefully, Bruce, can you see my screen here? Hey Bruce, yes. are you? Yep. Oh, okay, yep. oh, sweet. So the the twenty nine dollars a month gives you these the access to the cloud notes, which which are these levels that you can see on the left of my screen here. Ninety nine dollars gives you access to uh, we write two notes every day before the open and after the close, summarizing what we see, a whole bunch of stuff on the website, etc. 
Um, so that's what $99 is. Um, so $29, you know, gives you these levels piped in, uh, which if you just worry about support and resistance lines, options based support and resistance lines, and then that mm -hmm. might uh, satisfy you, or maybe you start with the getting our analysis every day so you can start to understand what we're talking about and then transition to just the levels. Uh, but I just wanted to quickly touch on that. Um, so we're going to follow up kind of on what we talked about on Wednesday, but what we really wanted to do today was dig into a little bit more data-based um, analysis, sort of what it is that's driving these models and how options are affecting the market. And what's great is that the market sort of is, is dropping like a rock, which um, gives us some more interesting things to talk about. So what happened yesterday and uh, what really we think was the big driver of, of the market crash was this concept of market shifting from what we call positive gamma market to a negative gamma market. And what we mean by that is that when there's a, when we calculate there's a positive gamma market, we're saying that options dealers are functioning in a way that suppresses volatility. And what we, what we mean by that is that their hedging flows dictate that when the market goes up, they start to sell futures. And when the market goes down, they start to buy futures, right? So you can imagine that if those are big enough hedging flows, that compresses the market, right? It keeps the market in a range and, and volatility declines because of that, right? And if the market shifts and dealer hedging flows shift from being in a positive gamma position to what's called a negative gamma position, that means that dealers are going to start hedging in the same direction as the market. So instead of buying when the market goes down, they're selling as the market goes down. So we have this concept of the volatility trigger. And what the volatility trigger is, it's our metric of where we think gamma flips from positive to negative, or said another way, we think that dealers go from buying dips to selling into dips, selling the market. And so you can imagine that if all of a sudden market makers start to short futures and the market starts to go down, that's kind of like dumping gasoline on a fire, right? You get this really brief, quick, you know, uh, spurt lower. <clears throat> and so you can see that that volatility level, uh, volatility trigger level today, you know, where gamma flips from positive to negative is all the way up at 38.65. And so what that tells us just to frame today's market is that we expect a lot of volatility today, right? Because if the market starts to sell off, dealers are going to start shorting, market makers are going to start shorting. And if the market suddenly catches a bid and starts to bounce, the market maker is going to buy that and it's going to rip. So instead of getting, you know, 10, 15 point moves on the day, we're going to get 50 50 handle, 60, 75 handle swings on the day. Um, and so conceptually, when you guys are trading and you're thinking about your swing trader, if you're a swing trader or scalping or whatever it is you may want to do, like whatever your strategy is, we think that's an important component of understanding, right? If you're a swing trader today, I would be looking for a 50 handle, right? But late last week before options expiration, when gamma was really high and positive and dealers were really suppressing volatility, I would only try to maybe make 10 points on a swing, right? Um, hopefully that, that sort of makes some sense. So let's talk, just, I want to dig into what some of these levels mean, what we're seeing, but I want to talk about the market here as we're watching it. So we show a bunch of different levels on here and you notice that they're labeled L1, L2, L3, L4, et cetera. L stands for level with one being the biggest level and five being the smallest level. So we know here we have this concept of combo, which is level one at 38.33. This is telling us that the biggest position from a combined spider and SPX options position from a hedging perspective, this is the biggest level on the board, meaning that there's a lot of options tied rate to this strike. And anytime we have a lot of options at a strike, we think that hedging flows are tied or correlated to that level. So many of you are familiar with this concept of, you know, wherever liquidity is, the market's just going to go there, right? Liquidity or, or, or price goes to liquidity. And that's kind of the same same concept, right? Our levels are telling you where options market makers may have to hedge because there's big options position related to that, to, to those strikes. So, you know, in the context of today, we're looking for big swings and big moves and we're looking for big swings and big moves between these positions. Right, which are which are fairly spread out over over the over the range of trading. So let's just give you some examples or or show you sort of under the hood as to why and how we think that that the market will move this way. So one day I'm gonna learn how to start slideshows uh, more efficiently. Here, here we go. <laughs> so let's just talk about what happens from a basic 
you know, hedging perspective. This here happens to be GameStop stock, um, but it works the same way in the S&P, right? If a trader goes out, like if you all start to come out and buy call options, the immediate thing that a market maker has to do is buy stock as a hedge. And that's because they're short those calls. If you buy calls and I'm the market maker, I'm there for short those calls, right? And the first thing I got to do is go out and buy stock to hedge myself. And then as the market goes up or if the market goes up, I got to keep buying more and more and more stock as a hedge. So that's the concept of gamma, right? If you think about what happens when someone puts a big trade in the market, right? If I come in right now and I buy 10,000 calls, a market maker needs to immediately hedge that position, right? They cannot take directional risk. So they're going to immediately go out and buy futures. And once that trade is on, if the market doesn't move anymore, then their delta hedge, they don't have any more trading to do. But if the market goes up or goes down, they have to adjust that hedge, right? That hedge amount. That's a that's the gamma component of this. Gamma hedging is just the adjustment that they need to make for hedges. And that's why we tend to talk more about gamma hedging than delta hedging because you know the market dropped 50 candles today. Well, the adjustment to that to their to their trading is going to be you know, a lot of gamma hedging, gamma adjustment. So in this case here, when we see that the dealers have to buy more stock as the market goes up, this is indicating that because people are buying calls, dealers are short calls, which means they have a short gamma position. They have a negative gamma position, which means they have to buy as the market goes up. Now, if big traders were selling calls, dealers would then be long gamma and they would be shorting as the market goes up, right? So that's the volatility piece of this now think about puts Puts is the same thing right if you come out and and you buy a big excuse me sorry about that a big put option dealers got a short stock they got a short futures so yesterday all of a sudden everyone started freaking out the the bond market you know had a pretty ugly auction and there's a bunch of concerns there and people start buying puts well what happens when they buy puts dealers got to come out in short futures so you have a double whammy position where you have negative gamma in the market, which means that as the market goes down, dealers need to start to sell futures. And then on top of that, people come out and start buying puts. And when people start buying puts, that's the delta hedge that they have to get on top of that gamma. So they're selling short because they have to hedge their gamma and then new option trades are coming in, which means they got to short more futures. So that can, that can really add to the velocity of the move, right? When people come out and start buying puts, that's going to make the market drop faster. And when people say, okay, it's time to buy calls, it's going to make the market go up faster because dealers are going to buy futures to hedge that call position. So if we look at where the big strikes are existing, right, tied to the gamma piece of this, there's two big zones that we see right now, 3,800. And what you're looking at here is call gamma on the top, how much call gamma is there, and then how much put gamma is on the bottom. And you can see here, it's subtle, but there's a there's a there's a curve in here, right? This is net call positions up here north of 3850, particularly over 3900. And then as we go lower in the market through 3800, you can see that the amount of put gamma is larger. So what this is telling us is that as the market goes down through 3850 and particularly to 3800, there's more put gamma hiding in there. That means that there's going to be more selling, more futures that have to be sold by market makers to hedge, right? And you can see it's very subtle in here, but it, it, it's there. And this picture is obviously changing rapidly, you know, as the days uh, go on and new volume is added, et cetera. So risk from our perspective, and when we flip back to the futures uh, book map system, you can hopefully kind of get this concept, right? But there's big puts here at 3850. There's a pretty neutral level. When I say neutral, meaning call gamma and put gamma is fairly equal at 3,800. And then it's really under here where the put strikes start to pick up in terms of, you know, there's larger net put gamma, right? If you were to sort of net these two bars out, take this put gamma line and subtract the call gamma line here, you come out with a bigger net negative number, meaning more futures to be sold down here. So 3,800 is a very critical level as we view it today because it sort of unlocks this put gamma, right? Gamma is highest for at the money strikes. So as we get closer to 3,700, these puts pick up in value, they pick up in their hedging requirement. So that is why we really note, you know, some of these levels that are important because in general, you're talking support and resistance zones, right? Because if 3,800 hits, a lot of options probably shift around because, you know, the 3,800 is now at the money, right? And if I own a 3,800 put and the market goes down there, I might sell that put and adjust and et cetera, right? So those can be, that's why we see support and resistance zones there. It's a big, even number as well. But 
conceptually outside of just the intraday sort of looking at what the immediate support and resistance zone is you have to overlay this idea of positive and negative gamma right the the deeper we go through 3800 if we break that level the more directional the more volatility there is the more the market is going to get short and then the more the market's going to rip back you know when we uh you know when and if we get sort of a bounce in the markets right and the higher we go to the other side, if we get up over 3,900, this is the positive gamma area. And we call it positive gamma because there's so much call positions there. Um, and, and so the hedging flows are likely to tighten up and suppress volatility as we get over 3,900. So again, we have the intraday levels which matter, but the levels are sort of in the context of overall volatility and what is happening, how much you know move, uh, movement potential is there. So yesterday, this is sort of the map of yesterday, right? Yesterday we opened over 3,300, uh, excuse me, over 3,900, and the market sort of held for a very brief moment at the 3,900 level, which is you know one of the big strikes as mentioned here. But then it hit what we call this air pocket, and what had happened was on Tuesday, remember there was a pretty sharp drawdown. Everybody closed puts on Tuesday, and then the market had this really big rally on wednesday after you know the fed came out and said hey you know things are great and sprinkled fairy dust and everybody in the market went up you know one something percent that created this air pocket and we say it's an air pocket because all these hedges that were in this area were removed and that left sort of no strikes in here to sort of catch the fall right and so what happened is when the market woke up on thursday and was very unhappy there's no options hedging activity to support any kind of bounce in here and then we had put starting to be added to the market, people came out and started to hedge. And then all of a sudden you have sort of no impetus for dealers to hedge in this area because volatility is very low, uh, excuse me, gamma is very low, but we do have to hedge a whole bunch of new put positions. So dealers are just gonna start shorting and shorting and shorting, shorting. And then as many of you noted, you know, we got a very strong bounce of what's called the put wall. And the put wall is where we calculate the most put options in the market. So this put wall is telling you where the biggest sort of hedge level is. And the fact that it's around 38.25 or it's around at one where, where things are currently trading is telling you that there's some large entities that are hedging this market, right? There's concern from sort of big players out there. And the idea with the put wall is that when the market hits 38.25 or hits the put wall, traders will roll those options, they will roll their put options. And as we mentioned before, gamma is highest for an at the money option. And so if you own a put, you're likely to want to roll or close your position when gamma hits that at the money line, because that is sort of, you could argue that's sort of the peak value, right, of your of your put. You maybe want to roll that down to a lower strike, you know, cash that put out and, and exchange it for something that's far out of the money, sort of adjust your head, right? And that's kind of the idea of why we would get a bounce here. Because again, if you buy a put and a dealer has to short futures to hedge when you sell that put dealers got to buy futures back right so so again we hit all this big put line people cash out their puts dealers can then buy futures back and that's sort of what we think is the fuel or the impetus for the market to bounce at this you know put wall level i would note that usually what happens when we have these big drawdowns are oftentimes that we will see net put options close and, and maybe I should show this on our site. Uh, generally, what happens is we see put options net close. If, if you pay for the bookmap uh, spot gamma pro version, you can see this data here. Uh, but usually, this is what this is showing is open interest and the open interest change day over day in S and P. And note here that open interest built up overnight. Right? There's no strike that had a net closure of puts yesterday. In other words, on net, nobody closed their put hedges yesterday, even though the market was down, it was pretty violent move down, right? So no, I view STX as an institutional uh, instrument, right? It's, it's usually bigger traders, people that know what they're doing trading the SPX options. It's more expensive as well. So nobody net closed puts, right, in the SPX. And I mentioned this in the note this morning, but check out spiders. People, anyone that had an in the money spider yesterday, anything above 385, they closed out all their put contracts. In other words, retail took all their hedges off, they're out of the money, or excuse me, they're in the money hedges off, they monetized their hedges, but the professionals didn't, which is really kind of an interesting signal, right? Um, something to think about. And again, this is net put open interest change. So volume on the day is going to be bigger, obviously, than what the open interest change was. So if we 
bring that back into sort of the way that the market is reacting today, you can see, you know, we have these large gamma areas and 38.10 here is, is providing some pretty interesting support, you know, right in here. And what we're looking for today is a signal that volatility will come off. And in general, we will watch the VIX for that. And the reason that we watch the VIX for that is because the VIX is telling us essentially the cost of options or the activity in options. If you're a volatility quant or you're trying to you know, run a, a quantitative volatility fund, you're, you're probably going to listen to me say, watch the VIX and scoff at that. Uh, but in general, if we're, if we're trading futures and we're watching the VIX and the VIX is coming down, that's telling us that options are being sold. And put options are more sensitive to volatility, right? And you can imagine that if options are getting sold when the market's going down, those are probably put options being sold. And so what does that mean when put options are getting sold? Well, it means that dealers have to buy futures back, right? That kind of ties into the put wall and is giving us some information. If dealers have to buy back futures, that's telling us that one of the biggest you know, trading entities out there, i.e. options market makers, are going to start buying back futures. And when they start to buy back futures, that makes put values drop more, which makes dealers buy back more futures, which makes other people close more puts, which makes dealers buy back more futures, right? It's a reflexive feedback loop that you sort of end up kicking off here, which is, you know, part of the reason you get such violent, you know, moves, right? Because new positions and positions adjustments are really adding into the volatility. So one, one thing I want to mention here, many people on this topic talk about this idea of VANA, and it's a label that has garnered a lot of interest. In, and I know this is a little bit more of an, an advanced topic, but we're kind of building on what we talked about on Wednesday. But I just want to give you guys an idea of, of what that is and how that works in the market. So we had talked about what, what the delta or the hedging requirement is of a market maker. So if you look at, let's say the market closed yesterday at 3830, the amount of deltas that the market makers had to hedge was roughly 1.2 billion. And we measure that as a positive figure. So the options position that market makers had on yesterday gave them positive market exposure of roughly 1.2 billion notional is what we calculate. So they would need to hedge this by selling futures, right? Because market makers don't want a directional, don't want directional risk. So their default position at the close of yesterday would have been 1.2 billion long options delta and then have been short enough futures to hedge that out, right? And and again, you know, there's um, I'm I'm going over this at a very high level view. So uh, don't try to, you know, create your own options book based on what I'm saying because there's things that net out, et cetera. But from a high level conceptual view, dealers are long options deltas, meaning they make market money if the market goes up and they short futures as the way to hedge themselves. So again, around 3,800 figure they're, they're roughly delta neutral, right? Meaning that if the market opened today at 3,830 and nothing happened, they would have no hedge adjustment. Obviously, as the market sells off, you could tell the red line moves up, meaning that their portfolio of options is getting longer. They're getting more directional risk as the market drops, but that directional risk, you know, they're essentially you know, long stock here, right? In a way, you could look at it that way as the market is going down, which is not a good thing. So the way they hedge themselves is by shorting more futures. So this is what happens just off of the S&P price moving, right? Now we talked about how volatility spikes as the market goes down, as all of you know, volatility spikes along with that, which means that put options, which market makers are net short, put options gain value, which means that market makers who are short puts are losing even more money, right? Or they're potentially losing more money. The way that they would hedge themselves, therefore, is actually shorting way more futures. So the red line is, is just price movement of the S&P 500. The black line here that you can see spikes up is what happens if implied volatility also spikes. And so you could see that they, rather than having to sell, so if we were to draw sort of a, a, a line parallel to the x-axis, you know, dealers would have this much to short if vol doesn't change, if implied volatility doesn't change, right? They would have to adjust from 38.30, they're call it 1.27 billion, so like 1.29 billion, right? So that's a small additional short that they would have to, they would have to sell some more futures, right, to hedge themselves. But once vol spikes, you can see how much more delta notional that they have to hedge against. And hopefully that that concept is is making sense. Now, the other con the other idea here is that if the market starts to go up and volatility goes down, what's interesting is you can see that their default position again they're getting longer. The market goes up, they can 
release or reduce some of their short position as the market goes up. But when implied volatility comes down, that means they actually have to just buy also selling futures as the market goes up towards 3,900. So this is that idea of they're, they have a negative gamma position here. They got to short a bunch. And if the market goes way up, they actually start selling some futures as well to adjust their hedge, right? And this really occurs around 3,900, which is why, you know, we kind of get stuck in the mud when we get up around the 3,900 area. And then the third concept, which I didn't really want to touch on here, but I'll just mention this, is that options decay over time, right? As time goes forward, options decay. And as market makers are short options, that means that all those puts that they're short lose value, right? Five days from now, all those puts that they own will likely have less value, all else being equal. So they have less deltas, they have less deltas to hedge, less long deltas to hedge. So that means they can reduce their short position, right? So in other words, over time, there's a buyback drift happening. Some of you probably would view that as what's called charm. And those are, you know, these big names that terms they kicked around. You can't look at any of this stuff in isolation because price time volatility is all interwoven and shifting. But if we were just sort of, sort of take one snapshot in time, this hopefully gives you a general idea of what the flows are um, that we've been talking about. So I'm gonna pause there. That was a lot to digest. I know we kind of went from like level one on Wednesday to like level 10 today. Um, if anyone has any questions, I can pause on that. If you guys don't have questions, I can start to talk about, um, I have some interesting things to mention about GameStop. This 3,800 level is really critical, we think, for the market um, because of those put positions, as we mentioned before. So um, we really want to see that the market is is supported here, and it will be, you know, really critical levels under this. You know, could really lock unlock some of that put covering that that short deltas uh, that that we had talked about, the, the short futures hedging that that dealers need to do. I mean, yeah, you can see the bid is getting pretty aggressive there. Um, so uh... Uh, they're bidding up from those from those levels. Uh, 3785 was in the book and and 90, but they're they're bidding now in front of it there. Yeah, and and so you know, uh, Bruce, we had, we had talked about what flows matter, and I, the, there's really two things that you would pick up. I think in the options are, are in the liquidity monitors here, and, and you're probably a little bit better versed. Well, you definitely are in explaining this, but you know, when it when a real time trade takes place, right? Um, dealers need to hedge immediately and, and they don't mess around with that, meaning they're not going to like put a bid out there and see if it gets hit and, you know, et cetera. They're going to hedge immediately. It's a directional hedge. To me, that's a stop run, right? So there's that immediate hedge requirement. And then the second one is, you know, at these big options levels, they know they have some hedging flow to readjust. And their their goal is to have to to really hedge and rehedge, I think, as little as possible because you know you want to avoid transaction costs and the like. So I think that's you know you're likely to see icebergs and and that type of flow, you know, post liquidity at, at these big options levels. And then I think a lot of times you'll see these kind of stop runs um, will take place when a big options trade comes in and takes place. Now, obviously, not every single trade and not every flow in the market is strictly options, uh, but the options is a big constant flow you know we talked about this on wednesday if you're a market maker or a prop trader and you have you know 10 million dollars to buy futures with or sell futures with once you once you do that trade you're done right there, there's no more trading for you unless the market moves a bunch but if you're an options market maker you're hedging and readjusting your hedge so you have essentially unlimited flow to trade right you have unlimited capital in that sense because you're you're hedging your book. You're not sort of making a directional bet and, and going to have a margin call because of that. Uh, you, you constantly have to adjust your adjust your flow. Well, uh, so just Brent, as what, is there a way to get real-time data levels intraday? So these big options areas don't adjust really intraday. We model this off of what's called open interest. Open interest is released once every day at 12 o'clock at night. Um, and so that's why our options models really only update once in the morning. Uh, we do give a update at night, which is generally just a recap of what happened. Um, as far as watching what intraday options flows are happening, uh, I could tell you that we are working on something really cool and that's going to come out soon and that's all we can say about that. Um, Dave says his head always hurts. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if the question or... <laughs> um, okay, so I'm kind of, uh, of interest... We don't have any interest, right? So we don't have any levels below 3,800. Uh, right. So when we model the the levels every day, 
uh, we show what are the biggest options levels and cut that off at a certain size of notional hedging. And we do that because, you know, there's options that exist at every single strike in the market, right? But only the biggest levels really matter and we kind of group those together. So what ends up happening is as gamma is highest for at the money options, you know, the, the options that are within say two or 3% of where the market is trading are where the biggest levels are, right? Because gamma is highest for at the money. If we break down below 3,700, then there's a new set of strikes that come into play because gamma is shifting lower. So we had been talking about 3,900 as a huge level with 3,800 kind of this middle area. Well, the other area that's going to matter now and come into major play is 3,700. So, you know, that is what this is going to show us, right? 3750 is the next level down and then 3700. When we're up at 3800, these levels, we just don't calculate. And, and I mean, we calculate them. We just don't push them out to the to the traders because in general, you know, these levels don't matter. So if we were to rerun the model right now, which we can do, you know, you'll see these other strikes really come into play. And now that we're breaking down through this 3800 level, if this is a real breakdown and not just sort of a test, you know, again, the velocity of the move could, could pick up uh, quite a bit. Um, so Simon also asked, what's your thoughts when the market like now goes through this level and pretty darn quick? So th there's, you know, you're going to get stop runs, right? You're going to get initial moves through. There's all sorts of different people, you know, trading for different reasons, right? And, and this breakdown through 3,800, you know, I'm not sure, you know, what would be the initial drawdown. The dealer flows that I would, you know, pay attention to are you're going to have to say, what is volatility doing? What is the VIX doing? And the reason that I watch that is if the VIX continues going higher, that is telling me that the price of options is staying higher and that people aren't closing their positions. The default move now is going to be in the prevailing direction of the market, which is down. And I would hold that conviction until the VIX turns. Because if the VIX turns, that's telling me that people are closing their hedges out and that dealer flows are going to start to turn higher because of that. So that's really what I try to watch, right? Because it's just going to be a guessing game otherwise as to what's going to happen. You know that the pressure is going to be lower. And if the VIX doesn't correspond, you know, you're not going to get the VIX going up while the market rips higher. It's just not going to happen in this situation. So, you know, there are occasional times where those the VIX will go up and the market goes up. And that's a whole nother topic. But in this situation here where the market's dropping and VIX is going up, um, that's telling you that options are getting more expensive, which is telling you that dealers have more shorts to hedge. Um, and so again, VIX up, market down. That's that's the thing I will watch for today. So so at thirty eight hundred, this read right now would be you'd be looking at the VIX and trying to figure out like what what might be happening. Uh, yeah, and I, around. I don't, I don't know that I can get the VIX in here. I've never. No, yeah, we. Uh, yeah. I think you can with D, with DX feed. Um, it's not the right symbol. I think it showed up there. I'm not not sure. Not sure if uh, we. Um, yeah, there you go. Yeah, I did just try that. And then, then let me do it. So you know, like, well, let's let's just look at. I mean, this is a really sloppy way to do this, but um, let's just check out the one of these VIX ETNs. So, you know, this is this is obviously an instrument for volatility. And again, I would I would look at the VIX and not the VXX, but just to give an idea here is, you know, as this low, we can take a look in a minute, but you know, this is like a hypersensitive VIX in a way. Um, this is obviously trade off the VIX curve. And so in a way, this is kind of a similar thing, right? If this is gonna trend higher, move higher, then we know that options are getting bought, volatility hedges are being put in place. Uh, and that likely means that, you know, things are things are gonna go go uh go south for markets. Um, any more questions come in this, in this area here? Um, when we say that we're watching VIX, what time frame? So um, that, that's a great question, uh, SJ. Um, what I generally like to watch for is, you know, when we're watching the VIX, like let's just say this was the VIX chart, and not the S&P. You know, if the VIX was gonna break down below sort of a recent low, you know, if it's really gonna trend lower, you, and I'm not sensitive to like a move this small in VIX and I know this is really crude and kind of embarrassing way to talk about the VIX by watching S&P futures, but you know, a new low, right, in VIX. And you can tell when, when a trend say over like a, you know, if you're watching sort of on a, some kind of a moving average, right? Like a, um, a 
10 minute moving average or something like that. You know, when that's really breaking down, when it's really trending lower is giving you the real, you know, the real signal. Um, and it's also interesting if the market revisits a low several times, you know, like the, the market's now tested 3,800 several times and I'm not sure what the VIX is doing, but if the VIX, if we've tested 3,800 several times and we test the 3,800 again and the VIX actually drops down, you know, that can really signal that, okay, this is not just another retest of, of a, sort of a high. It can be actually, you know, the real signal that, you know, this 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 time the retest of 3,800 from the downside will break higher if the VIX is lower than the last time it tested these two levels, if that makes sense. Um, but if, if you just watch it for a little bit, you'll start to get sort of the sense. Um, it's not something that you want to calibrate with, you know, a lot of detail, right? This is a which way is the VIX trending? If you just sort of look at it and don't think about it too much, you can tell, right? Uh, use a moving average maybe or something like that. You get a feeling for which way the thing is trending. Um, but but I guess new highs and new lows are kind of, in general, what we'd be looking at. Um, Simon, thank you very much. Glad the service is working out. Um, so what I watch, v, VX futures, VVX or UVXY, SJ. I, I, honestly, I just watched the VIX. There are people that watch Contango, you know, what's the what's the front month, uh, what's VIX doing versus the front month future and the like. Um, you can certainly get much more sophisticated than watching the VIX. Um, a lot of people that I talk to are trading future and the like aren't quite at that level of understanding the interaction of, you know, the VIX uh, curve and all the various VIX product. Um, but I think if you really want to be pure about it, you would watch at the money implied vol for SPX options um, is what I would do if, if that helps you. Um, okay, so Kendall, um, Kendall is saying that the VIX is failing at the overnight high, which may indicate that we may turn up. So um, Kendall, I know, has been watching her notes for a long time, so she probably understands this stuff uh, as well as I do at this point, as I <laughs> dumped all my knowledge out. <laughs> um, so I'll shift now. I just want to talk about GameStop and, and Tesla again quick. If, if people are interested on that, I'll move away from, from this topic. Um, briefly. So one of the things that's really interesting and ties into into what we've been talking about um, is this whole GameStop saga and the whole GameStop phenomenon. And what's really interesting, we were talking about how op options market makers hedge and how they adjust their hedges is that um, in GameStop, everyone's been buying calls, right? And the call gamma squeeze, which all of you are familiar with, which just harkens back to this idea of you know, when the, when the market goes up and dealers are short calls, they got to keep buying stock. This form, this is the form, uh, the foundation, excuse me, of gamma squeeze, right? Because more people come out and buy call options, which means as the stock goes higher, options market makers got to buy more stock. That's the gamma squeeze. So if a market maker has to, you know, if you're what's called the DPM or the primary market maker, you have to be out there making markets all the time, right? That's your requirement by the exchange. So you can imagine that if everyone comes out and starts buying calls, your inventory of long calls can get very full, right? And you could say, I don't really want to buy any more calls, but you still have to make your market. So what do you do? You raise the cost of those options. You make it more expensive for people to buy options. And by also raising the cost of those call options, you incent more people to want to sell options or sell calls. So what's interesting about that is that if we look at the oh, I have it in the site here. Sorry about that. Um, if you look at this chart here, this chart is showing you the cost of what we call an at the money option based on the percent of the stock price. So, in other words, in December and January, it cost you roughly five percent of the price of a share of stock to buy a call option, you know, an at what we call an at the money call option. When the capital blew up and everyone got the game of squeeze going the first time, that cost shot all the way up. 35 or 40 percent, right? The same option that you would have paid only 5 percent of a share went up to 40 percent of a share. So that cost went through the roof. What's interesting is, and what we thought would happen after this gamma squeeze is the best way to cap a gamma squeeze is to make calls just prohibitively expensive. You make them so expensive that no one wants to buy those calls, then guess what? The gamma squeeze dies, right? And so if you look at here, we actually had an 80% move in stock where I'm sort of circling here. You can see that call gamma or excuse me, call options, they got expensive for sure, right? But they only moved up from like 10% to like say 15%. Well, look what happened when the stock moved up 80 or 90% this week. Call options went all the way immediately to 20%. And, and I can tell you, I didn't update this chart from last night that, that this cost did not drop overnight. So in other words, 
now market makers are not messing around. It's like if you're going to try this sort of, we call it weaponized gamble, but if you're going to try to like jam us with a gamma squeeze, we're going to make calls so expensive that it clips your clips your ability to, to squeeze. Because because options in a way are just leverage, right? If if Bruce buys a call option for a dollar, a uh, hundred bucks, right? One dollar a ton or a hundred dollar notional cost. As a market maker, I have to immediately go out and spend several thousand dollars to buy stock as a hedge. And if the stock goes up, I got to buy more stock, right? So Bruce's hundred bucks has made me buy thousands of dollars worth of stock and then thousands of dollars more stock if he keeps going up, right? Bruce has used the leverage to make me buy stock. It's just a, a leverage mechanism. And so, you know, I would also say that when we have record long call options, you could read that as record leverage in the market. And so, you know, one of our themes this year is what's called volatility of volatility. If you have record leverage in a market, as everybody knows, it doesn't have to be options or anything else. Record leverage in a market means volatility. And, and you know, things are going to move a lot uh, because leverage is high. And that's just, you know, the function of, of markets in general. So um, anyways, I know I'm kind of being long winded here, but as we've made the cost of options very expensive, um, We'll show you kind of what the latest data is on GameStop, but they've made the, the price of options very expensive, and consequently, the big gamma strike has has moved up slightly. This was 95 bucks, and if we look at the historical record here, um, you can see that people are buying call options, right? Huge volumes yesterday, but mostly puts, right? The the call versus put volume switch. So we went from a huge day when the stock went up uh, 80%. This was on. Um, this was two days ago when the stock really moved much higher. You can see that there was a big slant to call volumes. You know, puts have obviously come in a big way, but there were still huge call volumes. But these call volumes are happening at prices that are just really kind of absurd, right? Um, and so that is really, you know, capping this move, uh, we think, in a major way. And so if we look at the price of GameStop, it's having a hard time maintaining, you know, higher prices. Now, the additional thing is that the market overall is very weak, obviously, so that is not a good tailwind if you're trying to create a stock pump, but these really high call prices are clipping that leverage. Um, and if you think, you know, if you're a Wall Street bets guy and you're going to go out buy a single share of stock, well, once you bought your single share of stock, your demand is done, right? Uh, but when you buy a call option, you're forcing market makers to keep hedging, right? They're going to keep buying as the stock goes up. So you, you're, you know, if you're just going to try to create this bubble by buying stock, you know, it's much harder to do than than is if you if you use leverage. So, um, so with that, I will take one kind of final round of questions here. Uh, Kendall called the market bottom, and it looks like she, at least for the short term, did a good job with that. Um, if there's any more questions, I'll take those. Um, yeah, Arnold asks, are these calculated off of SPX or ES futures? So these levels are calculated off of SPX index and SPY. So if it says combo, that is a combined SPX and S&P, sorry, SPX and SPY combination level. And then if it just says L3 or put wall, that's strictly SPX uh, denominated. I've looked at ES futures. Um, it's a whole lot more, it's a much more complicated calculation for me to work uh, for a variety of reasons. And I found that the impact actually was uh, immaterial to the levels. In other words, the S&P, SPX and SPY are so big that the S futures don't really um, seem to affect much of the calculation. Um, hey, Alex, we do not sell a course, uh, but if you go to spotgamma.com and you click on the FAQ, FAQ page, uh, we have a four-part video series that walks you through, you know, options 101 up into sort of this advanced modeling, a lot of stuff we talked about today. Um, so maybe try to start there. Uh, and then we, we've done a series of talks with Bookmap. Um, on YouTube and as well as our YouTube channel, which is a uh, spot gamma on YouTube. Um, okay, I think I got pretty much everybody's questions. Brent, I'm wondering if you have the metric for um, what you're talking about, the uh, uh, cost of the options um, versus the um, uh, the spike in, uh, in volatility. Yeah, so we can, um, I think I understand what you're asking. So we, we can measure this, um, we can measure this chart here, um, you know, kind of in any stock. And we sh we can show this as an applied volatility metric instead of, uh, you know, a percentage of how much an option costs. Um, 
what you know if you want to sort of measure what the impact of those flows are it's watching kind of this this i guess sort of day to day right because this is telling you what the hedge impact is of that delta shift so if you were to watch this in a time series or like a flip chart which is what we're actually trying to build then you could see how much that hedging adjustment would change you know day to day um i think is that is that sort of answering your question or I'm yeah sure i think so i mean um I, I guess the hedging would would um, um I'm just I'm wondering at, at what point will will the calls become too uh, expensive that you'll start to see like you know the the um, oh the, I see the, the, yeah, the gamma I starting to die down. Yeah, I mean you you can you can sort of in a way just almost sort of mentally do the math. I mean you know so what this is telling us that with the stock at 150 bucks you know it costs roughly 20 percent to 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 buy an at the money call option, which meant that. Uh, for an option in this case that expired in two days, which is what the dark purple dot is telling you, it's a two days to expiration. Somebody was going to pay roughly thirty dollars for a call that expires in two days. That's a very expensive option, right? Thirty dollars. It's a hundred multiplier. That's three grand. No retail trader is going to pay. I mean, not a smart retail trader is not going to pay three grand to buy a an option that expires in two days on on GameStop, right? So you really what happens is that the only people that can trade this then are volatility funds, right? Really guys that are hedging that know what they're doing, right? That that can be very active trading, that have automated trading systems. You know, this is a different, when volatility spikes as much as it's a different um, level of trader that's taking place, right? So you could say that these are these are retail traders down here getting this thing started again, and then the pro professional traders step in and market makers raise that, raise that cost. Um, and the other thing about it too is, is when, when people are buying options for this much, right? They're spending this much. That's a whole lot more sort of options premium that a market maker could make, right? Because they're short. If someone's going to buy thirty dollars, spend thirty dollars on this call, that means a dealer's, you know, collecting thirty dollars on this call and has a lot more time decay on their side, right? They suddenly have a whole bunch more padding uh, that gives them a lot more wiggle room, right? So, so they're probably happy to sell calls up here at that price. Um, because it, you know, it's extra. People are paying extra insurance almost in a way, if that makes sense. So, I mean, the 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 big volatility spike that you saw um, earlier, like they just kind of thought that it would. This is the price of the of the call options. It shouldn't go higher than that, and they just yeah, kind of got think, caught, you know, caught. I think what happened, if you're, you're talking about over here, was yeah. a variety of things. Um, one, I think everyone like at the time, this was unbelievably high volatility, right? Like people were going, I've never seen this before, <laughs> and then it went even higher. And that was part of of you know a variety of reasons. You know, uh, Elon Musk came out to buy the stock and all this, but there was also a lot of forced short covering, right? Um, there was a lot of hedge funds that were in trouble and having to and had margin calls you know which jacked this thing you know the stock itself even higher so i think that you know um really nobody thought that the that, that stock could really go up more than this right and then there was that sort of second wave um that that pushed the stock up i mean let's be clear like options volatility here is is very expensive right but if everyone goes out and starts buying the stock immediately here market makers still have to hedge themselves right even though the cost of options is very high in the short term the dealers still got to buy hedges right they still have to buy stock to hedge themselves so like when melvin capital goes out of business or has a huge margin call and the stock jumps up 40 you know 5 50 bucks in five minutes dealers got to hedge that right they, they have to be out there buying so that exacerbates the move you know they still have that directional hedge that they have to do it's just that they can try to limit the amount of new positions that come on and incent people to sell their calls, right? If they make the call expensive enough, you know, if you're long a call here at 50 bucks and suddenly you could sell it the next day, you know, with the stock at 150 and market makers are really raised the price of that call more, you're getting a double whammy. Like you made money on the fact that the stock went up and you made money on the fact that options market makers raised the value of those calls, right? They raised the cost of those calls. So you're able to sell at a much higher price. Um, is there a cheat sheet? Nicholas, uh, we need to send a cheat sheet out. A bunch of people have been asking for that. If you just email us at info at spotgamma.com, we, we can send you that, we can send you that cheat sheet over. Um, the level of today's date, Sean, good question. Um, that is simply a reference. That's simply a reference for when we, uh, it's two things. One is the date that we struck the file. So you want to make sure that's today's date because if it's not today, then that means you're on a stale file. And two, this is the price at which we uh, ran the um, 
our models, right? So basically, the the reference price for our models is uh, is is struck to this level. Um, so there's not a a hedging requirement around there, although sometimes the market seems to want to respect this level, which is I have a theory about, but no one can do that here. Um, would it be safe to say that dealers want the market to be in a positive gamma state? If so, uh, yes. So when when it's a positive gamma state, um, the market makers can collect their options decay, which is what they want. They can transact and collect, you know, more bids and offers. Um, I, I think what when dealers don't want something is they don't want the first round of GameStop, right? Um, because it, let's think about this for a minute, right? O options are a convex instrument, and, and what that means is that 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 the price of an option uh, has a curve to it that, that when because of gamma. So like in other words, if I buy a call option for a dollar and the stock goes up ten bucks, you know my call option value might spike up, you know, ten times that ten bucks, right? If I own a share of stock, I know I'm going to make ten bucks on the stock, right? But my option might go up a thousand percent, right? It might go up a, an exponential amount. Um, and so what I mean by this is. If you're a dealer, you can hedge small moves by buying and selling some shares of stock, right? But if volatility really spikes and the market drops a bunch, you know, put options, as everybody knows, you know, um, have a convex payoff. And if you're a dealer, you're on the other side of that convex payoff. So when volatility really spikes and the market really drops, um, the dealers are taking or are at the risk of taking sort of convex losses that can't be hedged by just using futures as a hedge, right? At some point, the only way to hedge yourself against a convex loss uh, is to own options. And so at a certain point, and that kind of almost harkens back to this, you know, um, this chart here, at a certain point, right, you can't buy enough stock to hedge yourself really from this move. If you're If you're short call options at 100 here, or at fifty dollars here, and the market spikes up, like you can't really buy enough stock to keep your hedge up, right? We, you really need to own options out of the money options to hedge yourself and to protect protect yourself. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping I'm sort of giving you guys a general idea here is that on the tail, right? When you talk about tail risk, the only way to hedge yourself from tail risk of a move higher or lower is really by owning options. So dealers are likely sort of to be wanting to also sell options in here because if someone sells them calls that means they're getting long calls um, and that sort of helps their hedging profile and, and, and protects them against tail risk uh, hopefully all that sort of made clear um, andrea andrea hopefully i pronounced your name right uh, is asking for the special offer link uh, i can of course can help you help with that one yep i've been putting it in the uh, it's in the chat box guys i put it in there several times already um here it is again Okay, so just take a, take a quick look there. Cool. So with that, I know it's a very big trading idea. So it uh, looks like the questions have pretty much calmed down. So um, I, th I think we'll we'll end it there. Um, okay. Um, let's see. Uh, well, nice nice uh, uh, look at that uh, uh, VIX there, uh, Kendall. Uh, look at the uh, nice move up, uh, almost 28, 28 or like 30 point move basically. Yeah. Um, the um, uh, oh, specials uh, now, guys. Just just to be a, a bit clear, clearer on uh, the product. Uh, the yes, Spot Gamma is now offering. It was ninety nine dollars uh, a month um, for the um, for the options levels uh, in that bookmap marketplace. It is now they're offering it for twenty nine dollars a month. Just the levels, though. Just these levels, like like Brent is showing there on that left column, the, the cloud notes column there. So you're just getting the levels, you're not getting his insights uh, and um, uh, his emails, uh, et cetera. Uh, so now this is all sold separately. Okay, this is an add-on. It's from the Bookmap Marketplace. The Bookmap Marketplace is for third-party vendors like Spot Gamma to um, sell their services and their products. You'll see other indicators, educational products in there, et cetera. So that's what the Bookmap Marketplace is all about. Uh, and um, uh, and Spot Gamma, Gamma is is offering something in there as well, All right? So it does not come with the Bookmap subscription. You got to have Bookmap first. Um, let's see here. Any other questions? Um, uh, the Cloud Notes. Um, well, uh, yeah, Todd. There, when whenever um, the way it works with the Cloud Notes, uh, uh, whenever Brent uh, updates uh, his notes, um, they will update in Bookmap. Um, you right, know, so 
Uh, that's generally 3 a.m. and then um, at 4 p.m. are those two update times. And then if the market really moves a lot, you know, intraday, we'll, we'll give an intraday update. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, let me, uh, let me share my screen for a moment here, uh, and just go through a few more things, guys, just to, just to clarify on some of these things, uh, before we, uh, uh call it a day here. Hold on just a minute. Okay. Okay, I just want to, um, since this is the last day, uh, and and thank you so much, uh, Brent. Um, th this stuff is is amazing. I mean, the the, the insight and the transparency uh, into what these bigger players are doing is is just amazing. Uh, so, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, can't thank you Please. enough. Like, uh, there's so many people, many people, and we we the daily webinars that we we host, um, many are using it, and um, I'm showing it as well. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, you, you can see it right here, uh, looking at some of these levels uh, in bookmap and look at, look at all this liquidity in here, okay? And we know this level is important. Uh, and then Kendall had a very nice read on that on the way out here. This is quite typical, all right? So uh, uh, anyway, and where did it go? The combo level, okay? Uh, right, right up to the combo level. I mean, look at this. It's just, you know, you can't get much better than that. Uh, and, uh, you know, top to bottom there, well, let's say you even got in here uh, just above 3,800. Well, you just, you just made 30 points. Uh, that's, that's pretty, pretty amazing. Um, the, uh, what I wanted to show you here, uh, you, you can also start to put this together with uh, stops and icebergs, you know, other insights, other transparencies into what's going on in the market here. So kind of a nice cachet of tools here. Uh, just wanted to go through um, the YouTube channel where you'll find the recording. Okay, go to our YouTube channel and then here under Pro Trader Webinar uh, Series. Um, I need to update the title. Sorry, Brent. Um, but uh, this is their previous one from Tuesday. Uh, and um, uh, let's see. Oh, back to the Bookmap Marketplace if you guys are interested. Okay, let me show you how you get to the marketplace. Uh, first from bookmap.com. Click on the More button here and then you can go to the marketplace here. Uh, go to the add-ons. Uh, and uh, well, I'll just I have it here quickly. Uh, it'll bring you into a page like this. Find Spot Gamma or do a search for Spot Gamma here. Okay, uh, and then uh, you'll see their products here. Click on the image, uh, and then you'll get the details here. So right now the offer is Spot Gamma Pro, which is $99 a month. Spot Gamma Levels. Click here, and you can see now it's $29 a month. Right. So that's how you can get this if you're interested. Uh, let's see. I think I've answered all the questions this is sold separately guys it's not a part of bookmap it is sold on the bookmap marketplace uh and just just lots of thank yous coming in uh, absolutely um so uh yeah thank you thank you guys uh for all the nice comments here uh how long is this special offer for um well this is moving forward uh and um i don't know if you wanted to comment on that uh brent uh, yeah, I mean, we're, uh, we've never offered the le just the levels before. That's a, that's a new thing for us to do. And, and because you guys have been uh, such great partners with us, you know, we're, we're going to, we're going to try that out. Um, we are, we do get a lot of questions on what the levels mean. So, um, you know, it, you can always try out the pro for a month, like I said, to get used to what we're talking about. And, and then maybe you kind of get the, the gist of what we're saying and all you want is the levels. Um, so, so that could be one piece of advice and you can always switch memberships in other words. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, yeah. Other than that, um, I think uh, that wraps it up. Uh, thanks again, Brent. Uh, very unique, uh, interesting, and insightful stuff um, on a level that uh, we've we've never really seen before. Uh, just uh, fantastic stuff. Yeah. Well, th thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to talk, and and I hope that that uh, didn't go <laughs> go over people's heads, and that my explanations of stuff was all right. Uh, was, well, uh, like like you said, you've got those. I tend to gab a lot and then go, oh no, what did I just say? <laughs> well, you have those those four videos. Uh, let me sh <laughs> let me show you guys um, where those are. Uh, oh, thanks for that, Bruce. Appreciate it. Yeah, the, these videos, guys, will explain this in, in a in a very nice way. And then you know, then you've also got these um, uh, these webinars here where he's going into a lot of detail, right? Uh, so. Um, 
Uh, Brent, maybe you can guide me from here. Yeah, click um, click fact there at the FAQ on the top bar. Okay. Yeah, there you go. So there's yeah. a four part yeah. series. Uh, these are some of the worst uh, images of me that I've ever had captured. And I think someone's <laughs> goofing on me, but um, but the content is good. <laughs> yeah, the, the content is excellent. I've watched all of them, uh, guys, and they start off from beginner uh, into intermediate and advanced. Uh, it gives a very good overview here. Uh, and then obviously Brent's gone into detail in all of these webinars here uh, on what's uh, uh, behind uh, these levels here. Uh, so you should find very, very helpful. I'll put this link into the chat as well uh, for you guys. So you can you can watch these if you're interested uh, and then uh, and then take it from there. Um, yeah, yeah, you can subscribe from the uh, uh, Bookmap Marketplace. Uh, you can also get it here from, uh, from spotgamma.com, okay? All right, guys. Well, uh, let's, that wraps it up. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Brent, again. Uh, and you, Bruce, uh, I appreciate it. Oh, we'll do it again, for sure. Sweet. All right. Have a good Thanks weekend, sir. everybody. All right. Enjoy your weekend. Bye-bye.